uh, thank you for a beer for being swift. I'm going to be um, readily swift but measured. So, first slide. Um, yeah, um, Moravian history in Moravian Ladakhi history and also international history. These four people are quite prominent. They're all somewhat famous. On the top left, Yeshko, who prepared a dictionary. On the top right, Franke. Bottom right, um, Joseph Gergen. And Sesson Pontuk on the bottom left. They're famous for being Bible translators. Internationally, Yeshka Franke and Gergen are also particularly famous as linguists and historians. And they're all school teachers. Yeshka Franke and Gergen started as school teachers. Sesson Pontuk founded a school, which is the um, Moravian Institute in Rajpur. That's part of a broader Moravian history, which goes back to at least the 17th century. Here's Yeshko. Um, he was, for the first 20 years of his adult life, he was a teacher of Latin and Greek in Southeast Germany. This building is the school where he taught. It's now a library. So, he um, was a fulfilled person who in, in, enjoyed teaching, would happy have spent his life doing it. But then at the age of 39, he was called to join the new Moravian mission in Kielang in Lahul on the left. And he spent the first summer of that year, 1857, he spent three months in Ladakh. So that's the palace in, 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 in Ladakh. That was his introduction to the study of the language. He was concerned both with the written language, but also the spoken language. And the contributions for which he's famous are first on the left, this dictionary, Tibetan English dictionary. What I wanted to highlight is that he has special reference, not only to the spoken, the literary language, but also what it says here, the prevailing dialects. So it's not just a Tibetan dictionary, it is also, we can say in some measure, a Ladakhi dictionary. On the top right, you can see this is taken more or less at random, and the circles that are for LD, which stands for Ladakhi. So he's pointing to Ladakhi words, Ladakhi usages, which he's collected. His main work, though, was to translate the Bible. On the bottom right, this is an extract from his New Testament. And this language was not in Ladakhi, but it was in literary Tibetan. And the idea that th is that this language should be accessible to people who read and write Tibetan, not only in Ladakh, but also in Darjeeling, in Lhasa, in Northeast Tibet, uh, and, and in calm. Mentioning all that, this is a specifically Moravian, specifically Christian, it relates to current language debates, which I'll come back to the end, at the end about local language and regional languages. So, so then on the educational side, um, this is a textbook from Kielang. As you can see, it's very simple, learning the alphabet. It's new technology though for Lahola, or even this part of India, it's produced on a lithographic press. The Moravians also ran schools. They were encouraged, indeed sponsored by the British Indian government, who wanted them to teach Urdu. This is another textbook. I, I think this is, we can say it's adult education. Uh, and you can also see it's three languages. Um, it is basically a guide for people who can read and write Tibetan to introduce them to Hindi and Urdu. So this is 1860s. Um, it's a reflection on the kind of multilingualism, which um, is still very much an issue in the Indian education system. So now moving to Ladakh, in 1885, the Moravians opened a mission in Leh. And in 1889, the first mission school um, took off. 
in a serious way. What happened was the Mohan Kashmir Wazir, the governor who was called Radha Kishan, he was a pundit from the valley. The way the Moravians describe it, um, he had um, a kind of crisis of conscience that he ought to do something for education. Uh, and so he basically gave an order that every family who had more than one child should send one child to the Moravian school. They, they didn't panic, but they were rather startled by this order, but they decided they should respond. They put together a teaching staff, Karl Marx. Karl Marx is not the communist philosopher, it's a medical doctor with the same name who is working in Ley. Um, Schrever, who is a German missionary, Gergen Sonam Wangel, he was a Tibetan who had settled in Nubra uh, and then came to Leh. He's the great grandfather of Elijah Gergen. Um, and many other Christians descended from him. Samuel Jordan, he's the grandfather of Elisa Jordan of the Jordan Missionary College, uh, not Missionary College, Degree College, and the Munchi of the British Joint Commissioner. So the school took off. Um, it settled down to around 60 students, um, but then it had a setback two years later when lead Karl Marx, in, in particular, he died of typhus, uh, so did his colleague Red Slob. Numbers died down, but the school continued. Later, we have a kind of snapshot of the school situation in Ley from Franca. Here is Franca on the right, and his wife, um, who he said is a better linguist than he was. Um, so that by that time, the mission school was rather smaller. Now only 10 students, maybe 20 on the roll, but only 10 turning up every day. Government school had actually rather the similar 20, but only 10 turning up on every day. There was an independent school sponsored by the mission by a fellow called Abdul Ghaffar, and then there were Quran schools. His, Franca's comment, they were doing their best, uh, timetable was erratic, they only met in the winter, Muslims were more interested in education than Buddhists, that's because they were engaged in business, whereas at this time the business, the Buddhists were more agriculture people. And then he made a series of comments about the, about, about language, um, he emphasized the importance of Hindustani, meaning Urdu. That's what people wanted to learn. There's also a question about classical Tibetan versus the spoken language, Ladakhi colloquial. And he made a, a general point, which was that um, it would be helpful to teach the spoken language. But for that, um, you needed to have textbooks, um, you needed to have a dictionary and it would be somebody's life's work to create that. He did make a contribution, um, and this is um, a textbook which he contributed. It was intended as a reader, and it's a collection of folk stories from this fellow in the middle who's called from Kalatse. The stories are, we can say, Ladakhi Tibetan with full classical spelling, but simple language. So this was a textbook um, for, 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 for use in Ladakhi schools. Briefly, I mentioned Joseph Gergen, continued. He was a school teacher. He also developed his own textbooks, building on the early um, Moravian predecessors in the 20s. Now coming I'm racing you through time um, to the 30s. Here, here is a picture of, I guess, a junior class of the Lay Middle School in 1931, picture taken by a British Army officer called Rupert Wilmot. Um, I think, I gather there was a, I believe there was a similar school in Kargil at this time, so a, a government school. This is 1931. In 19, also in 1931 in Kashmir, Jammu Kashmir, 
there were a series of communal disturbances between Hindus and Muslims. And there was a government inquiry called the Glancy Commission. This is Glancy himself. He, he was a British official. He summarizes the finding of his commission and what he's saying here uh, of all complaints, the most widespread complaint was that certain communities, especially the Muslims, weren't given a fair chance in the matter of education uh, and, and they weren't getting enough government jobs. There were only there were 842 primary schools in the whole state. That was already an increase, but it wasn't increasing fast enough. So still far too few. He had a particular comment on Ladakh. Um, and basically he's had recommendations from the Buddhist community. The Buddhist community actually were Kashmir Buddhists speaking on behalf of Ladakhi Buddhists. And they were making a complaint that there wasn't sufficient instruction in Bodhi. I'm picking up on this word Bodhi because to my knowledge, it's the first time that this word has been used to describe, quote, the common language of Ladakh. Um, the word basically means Tibetan, but this is a new word. One comment about the word is that it's a homonym. It looks like the word, the Buddhist word Bodhisattva for enlightenment. It's identifying or consolidating the identification of language with a particular religion. Rahul Sankrityayan, particularly interesting historical figure for the wider Indian history. He makes a kind of brief cameo appearance in Ladakh in 1933, it was his second visit. His personal history was he'd already had, I can say three, his, he was in his third or even his fourth career. He'd been an Arya Samaj activist. He'd been a Congress activist. He'd been imprisoned by the British. Now he was a Buddhist monk. He came to Ladakh in 1933. His significance was that he was, we can say he was an activist. He was an organizer. He was instrumental in starting the Ladakh Buddhist Education Society. He wasn't a member, he wasn't a member, but he was guiding behind the scenes. The people who were the leaders, the king, I guess a member of the Kalon family, Chetan Puntsug on the right, who was the secretary, um, Munchi, I'm not sure who he was, maybe a member of the leading family. Master, so he was a teacher of Master Morup Gyaltsen, he was a teacher of the middle school and known as Gyaltsen Shah. Um, Setan Puntsog was a skutak from a noble family from Sabu. He was a graduate of the middle school. That was his formal education. He'd also studied in Rizong Monastery. And um, Together, to Rahul Sankrachayan and Setan Puntsuk prepared a set of four textbooks, of which this is one. It was four readers, and for eight, um, four readers and a grammar were actually produced. They were published by the Commission Press in Calcutta on behalf of the Mahabodhi Society using a font which had been developed by Yeshkar in, in, for, for, for his Bible translation. For textbooks for Ladakh, but it was also hoped they would be used in Tibet and in Darjeeling and in Lahul. Uh, so this was something of a landmark in, what can we say, Tibetan Bodhi, Bodhi textbooks. They were used as textbooks until the 1960s. Um, just briefly, here is the introduction to the first textbook. There was an innovation. The innovation is that there is a spacing between the words as there is in Hindi, but not in Bodhiyak Tibetan. 
but it's meant to be easier for young learners. So this is what they introduced. And the books were reprinted in the 40s by the successor of the Ladakh Buddhist Education Society, Young Men's Buddhist Association, which is the predecessor of the Ladakh Buddhist Association. So there's a kind of genealogy of textbooks, a genealogy of, um, of, a, of, of associations. Setan Puntsog, um, his further career was, he became a Christian. He therefore wasn't um, a member of the Young Men's Buddhist Association. He did attend the first meeting. He became Tesselda um, and then information officer. And in 1951, he came up with a proposal for language for reform. The, I should say the proposal, it should be quite specific of what it was for. He was suggesting that the, there are different ways of writing, of using language. Um, for classical texts, you should use the classical language. But for day-to-day -day use, he was suggesting a simple way of writing Ladakhi. And he was suggesting simplified script. So the simplification were that in, in, in the written language, there are many prefixes and suffixes. He was saying that if they're not pronounced, they should be left out. Um, he was also saying that there should be some modified letters for certain sounds in English and Urdu loan words. So, for example, to express f as in foreigner or fires, I guess, um, they would use the third letter at the bottom, p, aspirated p with a dot across above it. And for a, there are, there are two letters in the alpha, Tibetan alphabet. There's a chung, small a, and a chen. Basically, they should use the small letter and, and, and not the a chung. That proposal um, didn't succeed. There, there were protests against it. It was um, suggested that this was a attack on Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist heritage. Um, basically, it was rejected. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it was the path not taken. It's understandable why it was rejected in those historical circumstances. There was a, a big element of politics. Um, nevertheless, perhaps it was an opportunity that was missed because it could have been an opportunity to develop a spoken ver a written version of the spoken language, which is not clearly associated with any one religious community. Final comments, um, set of comments uh, about sequels. These, these are more recent textbooks. The first two are from the 90s. Uh, written by Tashi Rabgas, Jamian Galtsen, and Tugdan Palden. Um, it says Ladakhi reader, it, it says Ladakh. Traditional spelling rules, however, quite difficult to learn. And, and, and on the right, there's a textbook which I was given last year. My basic, my own view, so I am expressing a view on the whole debate about classical spelling is you can teach everything provided you have good teachers and motivated students, but it's a challenge. Just wanted to highlight um, some comments on more recent research on language, on the relation of Ladakhi to Lhasa Tibetan and classical Tibetan. On the left, this is family tree. The basic point of the family tree, this is from Bettina Zeisler, is that Balti and Ladakhi and Purish, they're not descendants from Lhasa Tibetan or classical Tibetan, they are cousins. And on the right, just to highlight recent research, um, there is a Swiss scholar who's written a grammar of Purish Tibetan. I'm highlighting that because I know there are a lot of participants from Kargil. Some comments about what do we call this language? 
the top, it's cut and paste from the 1942 Young Buddhist Association. It's Birke Bodskat, basically means Tibetan in Tibetan script. Bodhi was the term used in the 1930s uh, and for a while after that when writing in English script. Now it's Bodhi, they basically all mean Tibetan. Uh, a comment, um, which is, it is possible to speak and write in different registers, different registers meaning lots of people when they write email texts or Facebook, they write in very careless English, but they can write good English. You can write in different ways. Brief reference since I'm in Singapore, the Singapore government wants everybody to speak perfect English in the way that I speak it. Most people in Singapore can speak that, but they also quite like to speak um, a fun local language called Singlish. And there is a movement basically which is saying that you can do both. So I think my own argument is that there are different possibilities for language and education in the dark. That's for discussion and debate. Um, final thing. Here's a brief advert for the Dark Studies. It's the our association IALS website, and this one Himalaya Journal. Um, I'm advertising that because I have an article, a joint article on textbooks, and you can read it there. Um, so that's me.